Well, hello there, IB Psychology students, and um, welcome to our first recorded lesson. I hope that everything is all right with you and you're managing to stay cheerful and positive as much as possible. Now, in uh, lieu of having um, an interactive lesson or being able to talk to each other, you could listen to my lovely voice for this particular unit because we are not allowed to have any kind of live conversation. What a shame. But anyway, um, here is the lesson. You can see it's on the sociocultural approach. You can see it's uh, we're continuing with the topic of cultural origins of behaviour and cognition. Um, our key study is there, Levine and Noren Zion, 1999, looking at the pace of life across various different countries and cultures. Okay, let me see if I can find the next slide. I'm not quite sure how to do this. Okay, ah, there we are. Okay, so um, at various points in this presentation, I'm going to say to you, pause the presentation because I want you to um, do a written task or do some research or just think about something. So the first thing I want you to do is to think about where you live, where you're from, your hometown, city or village. Now this can be your adopted hometown of Histon, Impington, Cambridge, wherever, or it could be the town that you are from. So it might be a small village, it might be a big city. Okay, so the next thing to do is think about how you would describe the pace of life um, in your hometown. Is it leisurely? Is everyone laid back? Is everyone very busy? Are they rushing around? Are they, is it crazy? Is it calm? So just pause the video now, pause the presentation and just make a note of the pace of life in your hometown. The second question I want you to make a note of, what effect do you think this pace of life has on you from a psychological perspective? So does it make you feel um, that you are properly home? Do you like it, a very busy environment? Does it make you feel a bit stressed? Do you feel calm? Do you feel happy there? So just pause the presentation and write down what you think. And finally, would you say that your hometown is representative of an individualistic or a collectivist culture? Now, those of you who did the work on cultural dimensions, last topic, and that should be all of you, so if you haven't done that work, you need to go back and do it. It's very interesting. Um, think about where you're from, think about your home country, um, and think about whether your country is individualistic or collectivist and whether that is also seen where you live. It's possible to live in one culture and live within a subculture within that culture. So I'll just pause the presentation and make a note of what you think. Right, so thinking about individualism and collectivism, it's just a reminder here. Um, the, we speak in very broad terms when we talk about individualism and collectivism. No country is ever just one or the other. There are all the kind of different shades, different types of individualism and collectivism. Um, really, individualism and collectivism exist on a kind of a spectrum. Uh, for example, within the United Kingdom, we would say we are an individualistic culture because we value independence, autonomy, and the, the kind of value of the individual. But within the UK, there are cultures such as um, Bangladeshi cultures, um, cultures from the Far East, um, maybe Orthodox Jewish cultures, who take a more collectivist approach to um, the way that they live. But if we're thinking in very broad strokes, we would designate either individual or collectivist to countries as a whole. So here's a list of countries. Pause the video. Don't look at the next slide yet. Pause the video and decide which of these you think is individualistic and which are collectivist. So just pause the video and have a go. Right, so here are the answers. Australia, very young country, um, the youngest country in the world, I think, isn't it? 
Um, very much individualist, though within the Aboriginal culture, the original Indigenous Australians, you would probably say that they were more collectivist. Indonesia is a collectivist culture. They focus on family. They have um, a different approach to the individual. The individual is important as part of a group. China, of course, um, huge power, um, huge culture um, with lots of other cultures within it, but mainly in, uh, collectivist, although China is becoming more individualistic. France, most of yes, Western Europe, individualistic, although the French are very conservative in terms of what they like to eat, um, the way that they uh, follow their traditions, but on the whole it's individualistic. Argentina, um, I would say is individualistic, even though they have a much stronger emphasis on the family um, and community than we do here in the UK. Norway, again, individualistic, very much this idea of the individual. Um, and Bangladesh, much more what you would call traditional um, community and family values. Okay, so I'm just going to let you read these excerpts um, in a minute. So first of all, um, there was someone posted something on a website about what you do and don't do if you live in New York. Um, any of you who've been to New York City will know it is not a place to dawdle too much apart from maybe Central Park. It's fast, it's busy. Um, people will bang into you. They probably won't say, sorry, New Yorkers always seem to be quite kind of... Um, unhappy they seem to be quite kind of sour faced and if you get in their way they'll then let you know it's kind of part of the new york culture um so this person from new york city is saying basically just do what you need to do to stop getting in people's ways you know the same is true of the um, underground in london if you stand on the left people will tut at you if you are not walking up the escalators you stand on the right so the people who are in a hurry who want to go, get quickly up the escalators can walk past you. So it's that similar big city, impatient kind of, what you know, what are you doing here? Like in New York, they might say, hey, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. Get out of my way, you know, whatever. Did you miss my accents? I bet you've missed my accents, haven't you? And then this guy's talking about just basically being a pain. So this is a very individualistic viewpoint. You're in my way. I'm in, I've got things to do. I'm busy. Get out of my way. So it's kind of an extreme version. Um, so what does this tell you about the experience of living in or visiting New York City? So you might want to pause the presentation here. Write your ideas down. And the next one is NYC, an example of individualism or collectivism pretty straightforward question. I don't think there's any doubt about that one, but I'll let you think about it. I'll let you write it down. And I will let you watch these. Click on the links. There are some really interesting videos here on the topic. Right, so if we're thinking about how this topic fits into our overall socio-cultural approach, this is how it fits in. Remember I said we are not doing essays on this topic. We're not doing any 22 mark essays that come on section B of paper one. It really is just short nine mark questions. We have cut down massively then on the amount of studies we need to do. If you love this subject and you want to look at it, you want to do a 22 mark question on it, you will then have to go and research other studies. But for most of us, for all of us, I think we're just doing it as a nine mark question. So have a look at this. This is how it fits in. You will notice that if you see on Levine and Norenzion, the study there, hopefully you can see my cursor hovering over Levine and Norenzion, you can also use this question, um, this study, to answer a question on cultural dimensions because it is the individualistic collectivist cultural dimension. So if you had a question on this in the exam, you wouldn't need to do Hofstede. You might mention Hofstede's cultural dimensions as ways of um, categorizing different aspects of cultures, but you could just use this study uh, because you are looking at the cultural dimension of individualism and collectivism. Um, if you have a question on culture and its influence on behavior, I would say just look at Levine and Norenzion. It's just because the behavior is obvious. 
With Hofstede, the, the behaviour is not as obvious. The behaviour in this study is pace of life. So really, this is a great study because it covers both of those questions. So um, what I'm going to do is I will post the study description on the assignments um, tab so you can read the study separately. It's a very interesting study. Very, very nice to see a field study. We often get these in sociocultural, but not often in many other um, approaches. I'll talk you through it and then you're going to have to read it on your own. It's not very long. So, um, really interesting topic this. Looking at the pace of life in 31 countries. Hugely ambitious study. Would have taken a long time to collect the data, a long time to analyse the data. Really, this would have taken months, if not a whole year, to conduct and analyse this study. Now, they had various, they had four hypotheses, actually. And one of them was that individualist cultures would have a faster pace of life than more collectivist cultures. Not a huge um, kind of revelation there. I mean, collectivist cultures have an emphasis on community and family. So they're not necessarily going to be more pushing the individual needs. Whereas if you're in a, a country like um, New York or London, um, a city like New York or London, people will be more focused on what they have to do that day. They won't necessarily be interested in what anyone else is doing. So it is a different focus. So why do you think they predicted this outcome in their hypothesis? So I've kind of told you that, but pause the presentation here and have a go at analysing this hypothesis. Individualistic cultures will have a faster pace of life than more collectivist cultures. As I say, I've probably already told you, but you have a think, write down your ideas. So just pause presentation now. Okay, so they, this the study thus tested whether individualism or collectivism is a useful construct to explain behaviour. So in this case, the behaviour being the pace of life. Now, I know that we don't evaluate these studies because we are not doing them as paper two, extended response questions. But I do want you to not lose that evaluative edge to your thinking. This is quite a difficult question. But um, I think it's one that would be worth thinking about. How might confirmation bias have affected the research process? Confirmation bias is what happens when you are sure that you are going to find something. So you really look for it in your results or in the behaviour that you're observing. So, for example, I might have confirmation bias that Marks and Spencers only design clothes for boring old fuddy-duddies. So I go into town, I go into one of their shops and I gravitate towards the areas that I feel have the really boring clothes that I certainly wouldn't want to wear and most of my friends wouldn't wear and that I feel are just old fashioned and outdated. And I kind of ignore the clothes that actually aren't like that because there are parts of Marks and Spencers that have some quite, quite stylish clothes. But confirmation bias would draw me to the fuddy-duddy clothes because I wouldn't want to kind of have my hypothesis be shown to be uh, wrong. So pause the presentation, have a little think and write down your ideas. Okay, now here are their hypotheses. Now in an answer on um, an exam, you would not have to write out each single hypothesis laboriously it's not going to add any value to your answer. What you would do is mention that they had four hypotheses or several hypotheses that touched on issues such as um, hot places are slower, um, individualistic cultures are faster. Do not, in your exam answers, avoid this ploddy regurgitating every boring detail of a study. Just choose the ones that are going to work for you. Now, based on these hypotheses, what do you think? Do any of these hypotheses re resonate with you? Now, what resonate means you look at it and you go, oh yeah, I, I really get that. I know what that means. So, you know, do you have any experience of any of these variables? 
For example, hotter places are slower. If I go to Greece in August, I don't move fast. I'm too hot. Now, I'm from the UK, so I'm not used to the heat. But do you think that is a maybe general kind of pattern? Do you think that the heat slows people down? Do you think that there are more collectivist cultures that in hotter places, for example, could there be a link? I'm going to pause, I'm going to let you pause the presentation, jot down any ideas you have. So pause it here, write down your ideas. Right, so the procedure, quite an ambitious procedure. Um, they took a large city in each of the 31 countries to use as their point of comparison. Why do you think the research was carried out in large cities rather than small villages? Again, I think that's pretty obvious, but I'm, pause the presentation, write down your ideas. Now, they had these particular measures here. Um, well, sorry, they're not the measures. I will get to the measures in a minute. This is how the data was collected, how they, they collected the, um, the pace of life by the three measures. Now, because it's such a massive study, if it was just one researcher and a few helpers, assistants conducting it, they'd have had to spend a lot of money and time traveling across the world to all these different countries. It's clearly not feasible. It's too expensive. It's too time consuming. It means you've got to stay in hotels. You've got to, it's just not possible to do it like that. So Levine and Norin Zion, um, they got in touch with students from the university that they taught at and they said, where, where are you going, you know, this summer? Where do you live? Are you going home? Do you live in Rio de Janeiro? Do you live in Vienna? Do you live wherever you live? Can you know, can you help us with our research? So they used an opportunity sample of students who were already going to those places so they didn't have to. Um, and they also used psychologists who were um, interested in cross-cultural issues who were already at universities in other countries. For example, they might have been in some in Sydney, in Australia. And they said to them, look, can you help us with this research? We can't do it all ourselves. So we have a big cross-cultural sample of helpers um, who are going to then sample the city. So the students of the psychologists, they were all the kind of what you might call confederates, a confederate sample to help the researcher. But the actual sample is the, is the cities in the 31 countries. Okay, so what did they use to indicate the pace of life? Uh, walking speed, speed of service at the post office, and interestingly, the accuracy of clocks in randomly selected banks. So very interesting that they're using these real life measures. They are not instigating any independent variable. This is a naturalistic observation. They are going to the cities, they have the measures, they just watch what happens. They just take the sampling from whatever is going on. So there is no independent variable. It's not an experiment, it's an observation. Oh my goodness, what an array of potential extraneous variables and possible sources of bias can, to contend with now, again, we're not analysing, we're not evaluating this study, but it's kind of crying out for it because let's just make sure we don't lose our evaluation skills. Let's do a bit of evaluation. So extraneous variables, sources of bias. You've got all of these people measuring the behaviours all across the world. You are not there as a, as a researcher. There is no independent variable. There are no control conditions. I'm sure that you can come up with at least three possible variables, extraneous variables, bias that could potentially um, skew your results. So I'll just pause that there and I'll let you uh, think about it. <coughs> so if you pause your presentation, you write down your ideas. Okay, so you might have said something like, how do you objectively judge walking speed? You are not actually physically timing people from point A to point B. It's so subjective. Um, also, someone might be walking slowly because they are ill 
or you know they've got a bad back or they're hung over or they're really tired they might be walking quickly because they've got to go they've got to get to a job interview or they're late for work they might not reflect their normal walking speed speed of service you might just have a really slow doddery person working that day or someone who's serving might want to go on their lunch break so they might be working quickly accuracy of clocks well, that will depend on how new the clock is. Has it been checked recently? Um, is the place, are the banks all that, um, you know, are they all kind of that interested in time as much as others are? So it's, there's lots of, you know, there are lots of, of sources of bias and, and extraneous variables you could have mentioned. Right, the results. So not hugely surprising to me that Japan and the Western European countries that were not from the ex-Soviet bloc, so not places like Latvia or the Czech Republic or Poland, had the fastest, oh, pardon me, fastest overall pace of life scores. And we've got the nine Western European countries all scoring from among the fastest 11 countries. Now, I don't think that is particularly surprising. Switzerland was the country with the fastest pace of life. That, I have to say, surprised me. That did surprise me. And I want you, if it surprised you, I want you to think why that might be the case. Just think about it. Um, the middle of the list, you've got your ex-Soviet bloc European countries, Czech Republic, Croatia, Poland, whatever. Newly industrialized Asian countries, maybe somewhere like India, China, and the USA. Now, that surprised me. USA, the peak of individualism, only got in the middle. Think again, you think about why that might have happened. And the slowest pace of life, non-industrialized countries, not a huge shock there. Middle East, Latin America, Asia. So do any of these results support any of the hypotheses? Well, yeah, some of them do, don't they? Have a think about it, have a look back at the hypotheses. Does anything surprise you about these results? Yes, it surprised me. Well, that's me. It might not have surprised you. You might live in Switzerland. You might say, whoa, it's a fast place, miss. It's, whoa, you know, time waits for no one in Switzerland. So have a little think about that. Put your um, presentation on pause and have a think about it. Okay, so you've had a think about it. You've written down your ideas. Um, I mean, Western Europe and Japan, I know Japan is a collectivist culture, but it's a very individualistic -y type collectivist culture. People in Japan have a collectivist mentality and that they think very much as a group, but it's a highly industrialized, productive country, Japan, where people are very focused on work. They will work more than they are, or have any leisure. They are really focused on it. So you can imagine how pace of life in Japan would be emphasized even though it is collectivist it's a it's not collectivist in the way that india is collectivist for example switzerland now that really surprised me and then well, the first time we did this study and one group i was talking to about it when we first did it said well the swiss are manic about time you have to be on time it's so precise in switzerland everything is just you know spit spot spot and I thought, well, yes, and of course, Swiss banks are famous throughout the world for having ult ultimate discretion and being very, very cut and dried about, you know, the way they um, look after money. Money is a biggie here, I think. Money is a big factor uh, linked to pace of life. Um, the USA, I mean, the USA is an interesting one because um, I can't remember from the original research whether there was more than one city... Um, in from the USA in the list. I mean, if you go to New York, it's fast. But if you went somewhere like Dallas in Texas, I haven't been, but I would kind of assume it might be a bit slower because Texans are notoriously laid back and they take their time and they're very much, you know, no one's going to rush me. So maybe that's a reflection of the fact that the USA is very culturally different state to state. Okay, so conclusion. Uh, the three of the four hypotheses were supported, uh, apart from the idea that more densely populated places are faster. That was not supported by the results. Uh, maybe that 
point there. Oh, I've lost my little, come on, where are you? Maybe this point here about more densely populated places. Maybe it's just physically, you can't be as fast when there are lots of people. Maybe that's why. Economic vitality emerged as the strongest predictor of pace of life in this study. Why do you think this might be? Pause the presentation, have a think about it. So, um, I think really that economic vitality, the link to pace of life is the like the expression, time is money. Come on, come on, time is money. Don't waste my time. You know, I'm, we're on the clock here. So it's this idea that you've got to be fast, you've got to stay fast to stay economically viable. If you slack off, then, oh, you know, you're going to lose your profits, um, which is a stupid thing to think because research has shown that it should, if you give people a, a slower pace of life and less, less of a workload, actually, they, they tend to be more productive. But that's economics, that's not so much psychology. Um, so time becomes valuable. Time is money. If you go somewhere like India... I haven't been to India, but I've been to Malaysia many years ago, 30 years ago, when it was fairly, I wouldn't say primitive, but very, very much kind of a more innocent place than the UK. And people were not focused on money there. They were very much focused on the quality of life. Um, and it was a very different kind of um, feeling. It was much slower, much more laid back. Right. So, I've attached the Levine and Narayanzen study uh, as a separate document on the assignment strand because I'd like you to answer a short answer question, an SAQ, and you can choose one of these two questions. Please revise the topic and the study and give yourself 20 minutes without the use of notes to answer either this question, explain the effect of culture on behaviour, slash cognition with reference to one study or explain one study of one cultural dimension with reference to one study. The next slide has an outline plan for answering either of these questions. Now I'll let you read through that. So A equates to the effective culture, B is the cultural dimension. So as you look through them you'll, you'll see that oh this is good for B, this is good for A, this point you would use for both of them, etc. So I've put four points, roughly four paragraphs. I wouldn't expect anyone to do more than four paragraphs for a question that takes 20 minutes to write. Um, okay, and remember, do not evaluate. It is an SAQ. You don't need no evaluation, no strengths, no limitations. Nothing like that, okay? Right. Any issues, any problems, just get in touch. And hopefully I will see you soon. Right.